Question 6. A page of printed text is placed 18 cm from a converging lens. This is 18 cm from the center of the lens, of focal length 35 cm. Figure 6.1 is a scale diagram of the arrangement with each of the two principal focuses, this and this, of the lens labeled F. Question A. A length of 1 cm on the scale diagram represents an actual length of 5 cm. So in your exams, when you have the actual paper and you use a ruler, you will get this as 1 cm, which equals to 5 cm as a scale. Part 1. By drawing on figure 6.1, look at the image of the page produced by the lens and label it as I. So this here is the image that you have. Your first step is, from the tip of the image, draw a horizontal straight line until the center of the lens. Like this, and this here would be your first step. Second, from the center of the lens, extend your line until you go through your focal point. Like this. And for the third step, from the tip of the image, draw a straight line passing through the center of the lens. Like this. Usually, you would have the rays that intercept over here. But in this case, you can see that the rays are actually diverging away from each other. Therefore, you should backtrack these rays until you reach an intercept. And you will see that your rays intercept somewhere here. So this here is where your image will be formed. And they ask you to label it as I. So you can just put an I at the side of it. Part 2. Using figure 6.1, determine the actual distance of image I from the lens. So to determine the actual distance of image I to the lens, we first have to find out this distance. Since I'm not doing this on my A4 paper, not able to get an accurate reading, but on your answer schemes, range of 7.1 cm to 7.7 .7 is acceptable. So we know here that 1 cm represents 5 cm. So on the grid, I obtained roughly about 7.3 cm, meaning that the actual distance of image I would be 36.5 cm. Based on your marking schemes, this is an acceptable range of answer. Question B. Converging lenses can be used as magnifying glasses. State whether the image produced when a lens is used as a magnifying glasses is real or virtual. Explain why. First of all, let's understand what is a real image versus a virtual image. Under the topic of lenses, you will learn how to draw rays that go through the lenses. And any images that form on this side would be real. And any images that forms on this region is called virtual. Virtual images are like the images that you see on a reflection of a mirror. An example of a real image is when you project light from the projector onto a screen. A magnifying glass will give you a virtual image. The reason is because, just like a mirror, the image cannot be projected on a screen. Question C. Suggest how someone who is long-sighted may benefit from using a converging lens. A person who is long-sightedness always have their image fall behind the retina, meaning that they cannot see far away objects clearly. In order to see objects clearly, we need the image to fall on the retina. So we need to focus all the ray to intercept at this point and not at this point. So to do that, we can place a convex lens so that all the rays can be diverged and formed on the retina. Question 7, Part A. A plastic rod is uncharged. Uncharged meaning that it has equal number of positive and negative ions. When the rod is rubbed with a woolen cloth, the rod becomes negatively charged. Explain, in terms of particles, why the rod becomes negatively charged. When discussing about transfer of charge, you must remember one important key point. Only electrons can move and positive ions does not move. So for this rod to become negatively charged, it means that right now it must have gained negative ions. Since only negative electrons can move, that means that the negative electrons from the cloth has now transferred into the rod. That's why the rod is now negatively charged. Question B. Figure 7.1 shows a negatively charged metal sphere S. There is an electric field surrounding S. State what is meant by an electric field. An electric field is a region where an electric charge experiences a force. 
If you don't know where to get definitions, you can always refer to your course specification and you can get the definition from there. And for instance, for this question, it does say that electric field is a region in which an electric charge experiences a force. So please use your specification as they can be very handy and useful. Part 2. On figure 7.1, draw the pattern of the electric field surrounding sphere S and indicate its direction. The electric field for positive charges are always directed away and the electric field for negative charges are directed inwards. So the pattern of electric field surrounding sphere S, which is a negative charge, will look like this. Question C. Figure 7.2 shows a small negative charge Z placed near to sphere S. So this here is negatively charged. Charge Z experiences a force due to the electric field surrounding S. On figure 7.2, draw an arrow to show the direction of this force on Z. We know that alike charges will repel each other, whereas opposite charges will attract each other. Since both are negative charges and they are alike, they will repel each other. So the force that acts on Z will be away from sphere S. Question 8. A cylinder is made of modeling clay. The modeling clay is an electrical conductor. Figure 8.1 shows the cylinder. You're labeled with the cross-sectional area and this is the length of the wire. The cylinder is connected into a circuit. Figure 8.2 shows that the circuit also includes a battery of electromotive force 9 voltage and a resistor P. The resistance of P is 4 ohms and the current in P is 1.5 amperes. Whenever you get a circuit like questions, I would strongly encourage you guys to lay out any information that is given in the question into your circuit. Question A. Calculate. Part 1. The magnitude x of the charge that flows through P in 600 seconds. Okay, let's first list down all the information that we have. We have the resistance, current, time, and we're looking to find Q. The formula related to charge is current times time. And this is pretty straightforward because you already have your current here which is 1.5 and the time given is 600 seconds. Just substitute your value and you will get a magnitude of 900. And the unit for charge is coulomb. Part 2. The resistance of the cylinder of modeling clay. So right now you're looking to find the resistance of the clay. According to Ohm's law, we know that voltage equals to current times resistance. Since we're looking to find the resistance, we need to know the charge of the clay and the voltage of the clay. In a series circuit, the current is the same everywhere, meaning that the current through the clay is also 1.5 amperes. However, the voltage is not the same. The voltage will be split accordingly to its resistance. So let's first find out what is the voltage in our resistor. Using Ohm's law, we can do that. So the voltage that flows in the resistor is 6 voltage. So you've got a total of 9 voltage. If 6 voltage is running through here, it means the balance 3 voltage is going through the clay. So the voltage here is 3. Now we can find our resistance. Rearranging the formula, we would get a value of 2 ohms. Question B. The cylinder is removed from the circuit and replaced with a new cylinder made of the same modeling clay. The new cylinder is twice the length and has half the cross-sectional area of the first cylinder. Calculate the time that now it takes for a charge of magnitude x to flow through resistor P. So you're looking to find a new time right now. The charge of magnitude x was 900 coulombs. To find time, you need to use the same formula, which is charge equals to current times time. Rearranging this formula, we will get time equals to charge over current. The charge was 900 coulombs, and previously the current from the circuit was 1.5 amperes. However, the current of the circuit will change right now because the resistance of the cylinder has changed. So let's look at the new resistance of the cylinder. Previously, the resistance of the cylinder was 2 ohms. And right now, the new cylinder is twice the length, meaning that the new resistance is 4 ohms. The reason is because resistance is directly proportional to its length. If the length increases twice, the resistance will also increase by twice. And the next modification is that it has half the cross-sectional area. If the cross-sectional area has been reduced by 2, the resistance of the circuit 
will also be impacted. This is because resistance is inversely proportional to its area. If the area decreases, the resistance increases. If the area decreases by 2, the resistance will increase by 2 as well. So the new resistance right now is 8 amperes. So in total, the resistance has increased by 4. The new resistance of the cylinder is 8 ohms. And the resistance of P is 4 ohms. Meaning that the total resistance of the circuit is 12 ohms. The total voltage of the circuit is 9 voltage. And now we can find the current of the whole circuit. So the new current of the circuit is 0.75 amperes. In a series circuit, the current flows the same everywhere. That means the current in the cylinder is also 0.75 amperes. So now we know that the current in the circuit is 0.75 amperes. Now we can calculate the time that it takes for a charge of magnitude X to flow through resistor P with a current of 0.75 amperes, which is 1200 seconds. Question 9. Many household smoke alarms contain a sample of the radioactive isotope americium-241. Question A. Americium-241 is the isotope of the element americium that has the nucleon number of 241. Part 1. State how the composition of a nucleus of americium-241 differs from that of a nucleus of americium-242. In a nucleus of an atom, we can find protons and neutrons. And the nucleon number over here is the total number of protons plus neutrons added up together. Since we are given with the same element which is americium, this means that both of them has the same proton number. Proton number plus neutron number equals to its nuclear number. One is 241 and the other is 242. If the proton number is the same, it means that they differ by having a different neutron number. Part 2. An atom of a different element has a nuclear number of 241. State two differences between the composition of a nucleus of this atom and a nucleus of americium-241. Right now, a different element is being used, meaning that the proton number is no longer similar to americium. So that would be your first difference. Since we know that they both have different proton numbers, let's say 100 and 120, in order to achieve the same nuclear number, they will also have a different neutron number. Question B. Americium-241 decays to an isotope of neptunium by alpha particles emission. Part 1. Complete the equation for this decay. This is a decay equation. The top number here represents its nuclear number and the bottom number represents its proton number. The nuclear number before must be equal to the nuclear number after. And same goes to the proton number. The proton number before have to be equal to the proton number after. To complete this equation, the first step would be to fill up the nuclear number and the proton number of an alpha particle. This is something that you should know. An alpha particle have a nuclide notation of 4 and 2. It can also be represented by a helium atom. You also need to know the nuclide notation of beta particle and gamma particles. Let's solve its nuclear number first. Since the before is 241, the after also have to be a total of 241. There are 4 here meaning that 241 take away 4 would be 237 over here. And now let's look at the bottom. The total here is 95 meaning that it has to equal to also the before over here which is 95. And you're done. Part 2. One reason for using an isotope that emits alpha particle in a smoke detector is that alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. Explain why alpha particles are more strongly ionizing than beta particles. I have made a video on this chapter to explain the ionizing effect and the penetration power of alpha, beta, and gamma particles. You can watch this to understand further. The reason the ionizing effect of alpha particles is greater than beta particles is because alpha particles are heavier, therefore they have a higher kinetic energy. And another reason is because it has more charges compared to the beta particles. Since you are given with two marks, make sure you state two reasons why. Part 3. The isotope of neptunium produced by americium is also radioactive. The decay of this isotope 
produces an isotope of protactinium which decays by beta emission. Beta particles are more penetrating than alpha particles. The half-life of neptunium is longer than 2 million years. Using this information, explain the advantage of this long half-life for the use and safe disposal of a household smoke alarm. So one of the advantages is that this is not hazardous to human. Alpha particles have few emissions per unit time. Question 10. The Milky Way is one of many billions of galaxies. Each galaxy contains many billions of stable stars. Part A. Stable stars transfer energy into space by emitting electromagnetic radiation from their surfaces. Describe what happens in the core of a stable star to release energy that is eventually transferred into the space. An example of a stable star in our solar system is the Sun. And we are asked to describe what happens in the core that leads to the release of energy that eventually goes into the space. So what happens in the core of a stable star is that the hydrogen nuclei fuses together to become a helium nuclei. This process is known as nuclear fusion. Question B. On the Earth, light from a distant galaxy is observed and analyzed by astronomers. This information is used to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth. In the chapter of space physics, you will learn about a phenomena of redshift whereby redshift is the increase in the observed wavelength of electromagnetic radiation emitted from receding stars and galaxies. This means that you will notice the light is being shifted to the red end of the spectrum. So part 1 describe how the observed light is different from when it was emitted. It will be different in a way that the wavelength is now longer and shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Part 2 State the quantity that the astronomers use to determine the speed at which the galaxy is moving away. So in order to determine the speed in which the galaxy is moving away from us, we are going to need to find the difference between the actual wavelength and the expected wavelength. So you can just write the change in wavelength is determined. Question C. The Hubble constant H0 is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the power of negative 18 per second. Calculate the distance from the Earth of a galaxy that is moving away at a speed of 1.3 times 10 to the power of 7 meters per second. So you are looking to find the distance and you are given with the speed and the Hubble constant. An important formula that you will learn from this chapter, Hubble constant equals to the velocity divided by its distance. So since we are looking for distance, we can use this formula. Rearranging this formula, we would get d equals to v over Hubble constant. And you will get a value of 5.9 times 10 to the power of 24. And the unit here is in meter. Part 2. Calculate and estimate for the age of the universe and give your answer in years. So the age of the universe can be obtained by 1 over Hubble constant. But remember that this answer here is in seconds and we are required to convert seconds into years. So we can do this by dividing 365 days and multiply it by 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute. And we will get a value of 1.4 times 10 to the power of 10 years. That's all for this video. Thank you for watching. For the next video, I'll be discussing on paper 4 tree. Bye!